Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, CAGBC for this wonderful invitation and uh, the chance to address your conference this morning. Uh, I'm really honored, and this is a subject which is very near and dear to my heart. Now, let's see if we can get the slides up there. So I, what I want to talk to you about this morning is um, a proposition that is perhaps not obvious to everyone, but is, is starting to dawn on people. Um, <clears throat> and that is, as cities intensify, develop, uh, grow more compact and more synergistic, they simultaneously grow more green and have a more powerful connection with nature and our place in nature. Um, and this theme, I think, is, is really very much in the, in the spirit of your title, Beyond the Buildings. Um, when I sat down a couple of years ago to write Walking Home, what I realized that in, is that in the decades that I have been practicing urban design, uh, planning, working in the field of architecture, there was an enormous transformation that occurred that really affected everything that I have done in my professional life and indeed personal life. And it's summarized in this little riff on Charles Darwin. Um, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, uh, building on a set of ideas that had been developing in the decades prior to the war, we developed an embrace of the automobile, uh, a wonderful tool, uh, but took it to an extreme where we actually transformed the urban landscape in all of our cities. And by the time two and a half generations had elapsed, most of us in North America and in many parts of the world actually live in auto-dependent communities reliant on what we thought would be an endless supply of inexpensive fossil fuel. And we're now being extremely challenged by that, and we are in the early stages of a major paradigm shift, a second major paradigm shift, where we are attempting to actually get back on our feet, finding other ways of getting around, which is really uh, what led me to choose Walking Home as the title of my book. Um, there are many reasons why we're going through this transformation, but not the least of which, of course, is the fact that we are entering uh, that period of peak oil. And although there may be fluctuations, for example, we're learning that because of the uh, world economy, uh, gasoline at the pump may cost slightly less this summer than it costs right now. Inevitably, uh, what we're looking at is a, a depletion of those easily accessible cheap sources of non-renewable energy, and gasoline will rise from $1.20, $1.30, to two, three, four, five dollars a liter, and at, at which point, uh, people who are basing their household budgets on maintaining a fleet of automobiles for most of their trips are gonna find that that is simply unsustainable. Uh, there are all kinds of collateral damage uh, that, that we didn't fully understand. And all of this is not just associated with the automobile, it's associated with a whole series of practices that we had developed uh, in, in a way of life that was based on um, not conserving energy, on uh, feeling that we could make um, enormous changes to the planet with impunity, and so all these things have caught up with us, the accumulation of different forms of waste, the impacts on air, land, and water. Um, and this, this has created a, a sense of urgency coupled with the economic imperative, uh, which is really leading us to be forced to change. Uh, another factor that has come into play now and uh, increasingly has brought people from the public health field into the field of city planning, including uh, Toronto's own medical officer of health, David uh, McEwen, is this relationship between people who don't walk and who spend a lot of their time looking at screens and chronic disease. 
and especially in children, what we are seeing is a generation of kids where obesity, diabetes, even heart disease among children has become a major factor. So all, all the more compelling reasons uh, to make the shift. Um, as all this has been going on, of course, it has, there are people who've been saying there is another way. And my, my great friend and mentor, Jane Jacobs, uh, who wrote Death and Life of Great American Cities uh, back in 1961, was one of the first to develop an understanding of how cities function, which we didn't use the term at the time, but could be described as much more ecological in her thinking, seeing the uh, uh, parallel between organized complexity in nature, particularly in, in the field of biology, and the way cities function and grow organically, and really drawing that connection to our place in the natural world. And very interestingly, in 1962, a year after Death and Life appeared, Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring uh, came out to great acclaim. And then in 1985, uh, Ann Sp Winston Spurn, who was teaching at MIT, wrote The Granite Garden. And her proposition was, and, and you can actually see it in the image on the cover of, of her book, uh, which shows the Boston Common and the public garden in the, in the heart of Boston, uh, that there is a very strong relationship between the presence of nature in cities, how we behave as natural organisms, and the ability to design with nature. And in our part of the world, Michael Huff, great landscape architect from this city, then wrote in 1995, Cities and Natural Process. All of these works have kind of laid the groundwork for a new way of thinking about cities or in terms of, of your theme uh, beyond the buildings. Um, just, just for fun, I've assembled this collage of images showing the changing understanding we have had of how the urban fits into the natural. So on the upper left is an image from Burnham's famous uh, plan for Chicago, uh, 1908. And at that time, really coming out of, of the Renaissance, uh, there was a sense that we could reshape the world, that you, we could, um, in, in a very classical and orthogonal, geometrical way, uh, we could shape cities. Of course, there was the great riverfront plan as part of Burnham's vision for Chicago. But it was very separate from the city. The city, the, the urban, was something totally different. Um, in 1939, when the New York World's Fair took place, General Motors had what was the most popular pavilion in the, in the fair. It was called Futurama. And you can see it on the lower left. And that was really the auto-oriented version of what the world would look like, where nature, what we now call green fields, was really seen as this vast territory into which we could expand ad infinitum uh, and essentially erasing nature in our path. And then there has always been lurking in our culture uh, this kind of sci-fi notion that when we spoiled our nest to the point of no return, uh, we would simply detach ourselves from planet Earth and escape somewhere else, which you uh, see represented in that, in that image on the right. So all of this is really being forced to change at this point. And what we're seeing is a, a reconciliation of the city and nature in a very interesting way. And my first really practical experience with this came when I left the city of Toronto in the late 1980s and in the, in the early 90s, I began a relationship with the city of St. Paul, the furthest navigable point uh, on the Mississippi River. Um, and St. Paul was a city which at that time, it was a state capital that was losing population, losing jobs, really hemorrhaging. And that community came together around a new vision of itself. In fact, renaming itself St. Paul on the Mississippi River and seeing to renew its, seeking to renew its roots with its place of origin on the river. And so my task, working with three mayors, 
uh, interestingly, Republicans and Democrats over uh, quite a period of time was to help the community make that transition. And the image you see on the left was really about a community that was growing greener, that was growing denser at the same time, that was filling in and was making that reconnection to the river. And as a kind of microcosm of that change, the image on the right is a little triangular parcel that at, at the time I began to work there was actually a drive-in bank and parking lot owned by First Bank, which was one of the major banks in the city. And First Bank donated that site to the city as part of this larger effort, and it became uh, this wonderful little park, which is, as you can see from the design, it was an international competition, became a symbol of the reconnection to the river and the greening of the city. What we have been learning on this journey is that the word sustainability, which we, we use a great deal, perhaps overuse, is not about a technological overlay only. It's not something we add to what we're already doing. It's not only about buildings, clearly. It's about the way we do everything. It's the sources of energy we tap into. It's the way we handle our waste. And very particularly, it's about the way we organize how we live. And in the little three-dimensional ideogram on the right, I've attempted to summarize what I think is the essential DNA of a sustainable community, which is everywhere you are, every phase of every project should as much as possible contain the ingredients you see there, places to work, places to live, places to shop, public space to share, access to a variety of forms of mobility, uh, the presence of arts, culture, recreation, all of those ingredients as much as possible a part of all neighborhoods. So we're reducing the necessity to travel long distances from one thing to another, which, which was the great mid 20th century paradigm of separation of land uses. <clears throat> we are also now able to understand much better our place in the larger natural settings that we inhabit as human beings, as, as urban citizens. And David Crombie did this community a great service uh, back in the 1980s when he was running what was called the Waterfront Commission. And he made us in Toronto realize that we were part of an ecosystem uh, with the recharge areas in the Oak Ridges Moraine, with all of the watersheds feeding into Lake Ontario, uh, with the Niagara Escarpment, that this bioregion, in effect, was really defining who we are. And I, my experience increasingly has drawn me, as, as I work on cities and with cities, to work at this level as well with scientists, with people who are familiar with, with these forces and impacts of the bioregion. Uh, for example, I briefly worked in Venezuela after the horrific mudslide that you see on the left, with, which in a matter of hours sent mud uh, and giant boulders crashing down the side of the Avila, the mountain uh, on the uh, ocean side of Caracas, killing about 15,000 people in a very short period of time, burying them under the mud. And what was, what was really um, very powerful is realizing that this was not a freak accident, that in fact people were living in harm's way, and had we looked back far enough into how this land was formed in the first place, we would have seen that this actually was a recurring event. We simply didn't understand the natural setting. We're going through this through something very similar in Toronto now with the Don River, where back in the 1950s on the Humber River, when Hurricane Hazel uh, struck this city, we had enormous flooding, and where the Don River, which was spared at that time, would be vulnerable to such a similar event. So the whole reshaping of the mouth of the Don River is a very active and important ongoing project. And this is one where uh, I was on a team that won an international competition uh, to create the scheme that you see there, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, an indication of the powerful restorative power of nature is the, the spit, also known as now as Tommy Thompson Park nearby. 
Uh, and you see this image from 2002, and here's 2009. This is an area created entirely out of debris, out of landfill from excavations in the city. It was originally meant to shape an outer harbor that never came to pass. But what is amazing, and I, I don't know how many of you have had the chance to visit this, is that through succession, nature has reestablished itself, creating this remarkable park in the heart of the city. So the, there, there is a power, a restorative power of nature that we're starting to understand. Uh, I've been working in Edmonton recently, and here's the North Saskatchewan River as it flows through Edmonton. And the incredible presence of wild nature, this river with 11 bows as it passes through Edmonton, 11 oxbows uh, and its neighboring communities is just a remarkable resource. And one of the joys of urban life in a dense city is that we can also have access to the presence of nature in this way. Um, here's another example. This is Buenos Aires. And Buenos Aires, you see in the, on the middle of the image, Puerto Madero, which was a great and powerful port, which has now been transformed into a thriving mixed-use area with a lot of the artifacts of the port era recycled. On the right is an area where they rejected the notion of just filling that large ecological reserve with condos and that Reserva Ecológica has become a great resource for the city. And as in Edmonton, having the capacity to have these two experiences side by side within a few hundred meters of each other, and my wife and I did, did this on a bicycle discovering um, this area, is again one of those great urban experiences of the city becoming more green and more urban simultaneously. So in city after city, this is what's going on. We're seeing a reconnection of cities with these great natural features. Most often, the, the reasons they were there in the first place, St. Paul on the Mississippi, Toronto uh, and on the Don River in the image below, uh, Boston, upper right on Boston Harbor and the Charles River Basin. Uh, the image below that is Hammarby Sojestad in Stockholm uh, with a very interesting cleanup and transformation of that uh, water body surrounding the city of Stockholm and a new neighborhood. So let me come back briefly to St. Paul and you can just see this progression, which is the one that we're experiencing over and over in city after city. Uh, the upper left in the 19th century, you see the city establishing itself, these beautiful limestone bluffs on the Mississippi River, the clearing of the forest. Uh, basically just cutting down all of the, of the tree canopy uh, below that and to the right, the barge fleet coming in, the hardening of the edges of the Mississippi River, uh, and in the two lower images, the removal of virtually all of the vegetation uh, covering the city with parking lots, going back to that total reliance, over-reliance on the automobile. And then just prior to my involvement, this, this was the, the decisive moment. The city invited Ben Thompson, uh, who was a native son, a uh, very famous architect and working in Boston. He had done Quincy Market, Faneuil Hall, to do a study for his native city. Um, and Ben went away, um, a study to advise them on, on what they should be doing. Ben went away for a few months and he came back, no study, but what he brought them was this watercolor image which he called the Great River Park. And it was really a kind of epiphany where he imagined, you saw what St. Paul actually looked like at the time, he imagined this verdant river valley of the Mississippi transformed and you know, he took many uh, liberties in this image, but this is really the inspiration that led to my work with St. Paul. And so working with that community, uh, we had many, many meetings, uh, community engagement over a period of years, but the, the key principles, the key guiding principles were around evoking a sense of place and restoring and establishing the unique urban ecology. 
And that, that was the state of affairs in that image uh, when we started. And we actually set up a storefront office outside City Hall where everybody in the municipality and in the surrounding county, uh, Ramsey County, who was involved in city building in any way, uh, people in parks departments, building departments, uh, transportation agencies, all sat around the table in a studio format working on this proposition of the reconnection of the city to its nature and seeing human beings as part of that nature. And in the photo, you see Tim Griffith, who's the current director of the Design Center. I served for a year as interim director. The transformation has absolutely been remarkable. And these images give some indication of areas we had targeted for very intensive redevelopment uh, in the yellow. So it, it, the city is gaining significantly in population and development as these efforts at greening are going on. And on the lower left is an image we discovered uh, from the 19th century. Horace Cleveland, the great landscape architect, had imagined um, a regional greenway system connecting uh, St. Paul on the right to Minneapolis, 12 miles upriver, uh, the partner in the Twin Cities, uh, through this whole set of greenway connections tying together uh, this whole bioregion, and so that is being pursued as well. Um, then linking redevelopment projects, which you see in gray, areas where new neighborhoods are being created, where infill projects uh, are coming forward, with every one with green connections tying neighborhood to neighborhood, neighborhoods to the river, neighborhoods to downtown. And all of this has produced an amazing transformation of the city, the cleanup of the Mississippi River, uh, a community effort that you see on the lower right where 35,000 trees were planted in the River Valley by school children and by employees of major companies who were given a day off uh, to plant saplings in the River Valley, the introduction of trails. Um, these things uh, happened in a, in a relatively short period of time, and here's a snapshot of that transformation on what's called the upper landing. Uh, when I started, that uh, scrapyard was there. Um, beside that, to the right, we actually moved a highway to the airport off the edge of the river up against the bluff line to reveal the opportunity in the two lower images to create a new neighborhood uh, right on the river, uh, embracing a trail system, which leads now not the highway to the airport, but the trail system to Minneapolis along the edge of the Mississippi River. And the new project for St. Paul is a new national park of 3,500 acres that will extend all the way from St. Paul along the Mississippi to Minneapolis. So shades of the Rouge River Park, the new national park which has just been announced in Toronto, this, this is not a phenomenon that's unique to, to St. Paul. It's just a, a wonderful example. Um, this notion of thinking of the city in nature has actually been extended even further. And this is a new city planning diagram that shows that all of the thinking about these areas of development, about connections that are, are merging, about places for intensification is all growing out of the river. The Mississippi River had all been ignored for most of the 20th century. The city had turned its back on it, and now it is becoming the great source of identity and really the, the focus of what people think about when they think about the Twin Cities. Um, this is Boston, Boston Harbor and the Charles River. Um, I have spent many years working in Boston. I continue to do so. All these little flags of different colors represent a variety of projects that I've worked on. I also served for a year as interim chief planner in Boston for Mayor Tom Menino, who is actually still mayor. And what I realized is that everything I worked on in Boston and the neighboring municipality of Cambridge actually touched in some way on the work of Frederick Law Olmsted uh, and his emerald necklace. Again, like Horace Cleveland, a great 19th century visionary, uh, this is the emerald necklace, which in many ways was a water treatment project. 
It really had to do with drainage of the city, but creating this, this wonderful park network that drained into the Charles River with the fens uh, and the great parks that you see here. And my particular charge from Mayor Menino came right on the heels of the big dig, where in, in you can see the, the area where that central artery that had been built in 1950 was actually removed from the city. Um, this, this is what it had looked like. So the river was not a river as we would know it. It was a river of traffic that ran right through the heart of the city. This, this was the total embrace uh, of the automobile that we experienced all the way across North America. And so it had been removed. It had been taken down. And this was a project of the Massachusetts Turnpike Authority. And the mayor's question to me was how do I capitalize on the Rose Kennedy Greenway, which took its place. This is in, in the north end. It's a wonderful park by Catherine Gustafson out of Seattle. Uh, you can see in the upper right what it replaced. And how do I now use this huge effort um, paid for by US taxpayers uh, at, at great expense and leverage this for the benefit of the city? And so part of what I came back to the mayor with is summarized in this diagram, which became the Crossroads Project, which suggested that there could be, as the city filled in, and here, here's where the growing denser part occurs, everything that you see in the reddish color is actually new development, much of which has actually occurred and is being planned in Boston um, and in the South Boston waterfront on, on the left-hand part of the image. Um, as that is occurring, the idea of this plan was to develop these public realm elements, which you see here, six miles of streets that would go from the heart of the city out to the bodies of water across the Rose Kennedy Greenway. And these would be treated as 21st century streets, really emphasizing forms of mobility other than automobile traffic uh, incorporating public art, incorporating greening, new sustainable techniques. And he here's just an example of one of these which has been constructed now, which is Broad Street, which leads to the famous Rose Wharf uh, on the harbor. So now to Toronto. And one of the signature projects in this whole effort of thinking about sustainability more broadly has been the Lower Don. And in 2006, Waterfront Toronto and the City of Toronto stopped a whole series of environmental assessments which were dealing with the problems of flood proofing, infrastructure, transportation, urban development in the proverbial silos and said, let's hold an international design competition. Let's look at all of these issues together as a design problem. And it was one of the most interesting competitions I've ever participated in, because not only did we have all the traditional design disciplines, but we actually had scientists. We had physicists and biologists who were looking at the behavior of the river and modeling it uh, with the idea of coming up with a solution that would fuse all of these different issues into a combined solution. And just to illustrate the change in attitude, the remarkable change in attitude that has come about, on the upper image, you see the Toronto Harbor Commission plan from the early part of the 20th century to essentially drain and fill in what they called a swamp, which was actually Ashbridge's Bay. It was the largest wetland on the Great Lakes, an incredibly rich and fertile habitat. They filled it in entirely, creating 1,000 acres, which they thought would become a major industrial area, which actually never materialized. And in the bottom image is a whole new way of looking at that site as part of the Don River watershed, as part of a powerful piece of organic and living nature in the heart of the city. And so what emerged is a scheme which wove all those things together and created a 135-acre estuary on the river, which allowed the river to behave as a dynamic body of water uh, with great fluctuations in levels, uh, given the regulatory event that we were designing to and a variety of ways of accommodating uh, the flood proofing, but also as the setting 
for a whole series of new communities and both human habitat formation and natural habitat formation with perched wetlands on the river uh, with a whole series of parks and with housing for 25,000 people and 10,000 people working on the site. These are not mutually exclusive goals. They actually are mutually supporting. Having that wonderful natural setting actually makes this much more attractive for development and vice versa. Um, one of the many techniques that we employed which pick up this theme is harvesting the rainwater from the buildings uh, in the orange uh, for irrigation of street trees, in the blue for irrigation of the perched wetlands along the river uh, in times of drought and the various different types of habitat that would form. This is not like a typical landscape project where you put in all the plant material. What you're really doing is creating the conditions for nature in this area to reestablish itself, much in the spirit of the spit, which I showed you earlier. Uh, this, this is a plan which shows that uh, from a human and social standpoint going to the triple bottom line, this is not just about building a cluster of condos, but the libraries, the daycare, the community centers, the schools, the access to transit, local shopping, all of these things have to find their place in true neighborhoods with housing for a diverse population. Um, by doing these things and by focusing on uh, using a whole series of alternative uh, ways of deriving energy and dealing with waste management, uh, the goal here is to arrive at a, uh, a very different uh, profile in terms of energy with, uh, by a series of um, steps, conservation, energy harvesting, building improvements, uh, solar and biomass, um, eventually, and cogeneration, eventually getting to carbon neutral and possibly even net plus if all of these are pursued. Um, as a result of this, this plan was selected by the U.S. Green Building Council and by the Clinton Foundation as one of the 17 climate change projects in the world to be followed and monitored. Um, this, these are a series of images that show the quality that we're now experiencing in cities, in urban life, where you have this combination of being in these wonderful park settings and in these uh, very intense urban settings, as I showed you in that image of Buenos Aires, side by side in the heart of the city. Um, as you probably know, uh, this project has been challenged by uh, the current civic administration on the theory that uh, we don't need so much park, and a lot of this is a frill, and why do we have to so actively pursue the goals of sustainability? Uh, the public has pushed back with enormous vigor uh, and continues to monitor this, and, and the jury is still out. We will actually be getting uh, some final reporting back at the end of the summer. Um, as these things happen, it's important to keep showing progress. And these are two wonderful parks nearby that have opened up on Toronto Harbor. Again, for those of you from out of town, I would encourage you to see them, Sugar Beach. And Sherburn Park, which is really interesting in the lower right, which is actually a water filtration plant, but forming a wonderful park with the collaboration of artists, landscape architects, and engineers working together. Um, Another example, this is from Sweden. This is Hammarby Sojestad. Uh, this is actually a water treatment facility, again, in the heart of this new neighborhood. Uh, Stockholm, trying to avoid sprawl out at the fringe, has created half a dozen of these very intensively developed new neighborhoods, each of which is addressing uh, the nearby body of water. Uh, introducing green elements, all wired by light rail transportation, and they have been able to uh, achieve a tremendous change in mobility in the cities where they're looking up at up to 80% of the population using other means uh, than the private automobile, and it's the change at the margin which is so impressive. Uh, they have waste techniques uh, which are quite extraordinary. It's based on a vacuum system, uh, where this series of portals exist in parks, streets, and buildings, 
Uh, you can have as many waste streams as the municipality uh, chooses to have. The waste travels at 70 kilometers an hour in these vacuum tunnels. It is never exposed to the air. It is then uh, moved into containers uh, in small terminals and shipped for various forms of recycling. So no more garbage trucks lumbering around the community, no more huge loading areas uh, in buildings. Uh, in the heart of the community, the sales office for the residential has actually been kept and transformed into an environmental center which is used by school kids in the community and by members of the community who are very engaged in this whole process of transformation of their neighborhood but also their lifestyles. Uh, this is what it looked like uh, probably about 15 years ago and in 10 years this transformation took place. And, and by coincidence, the numbers of people living and working is almost identical. The size of the land is almost identical to our Lower Down project. Um, this, this is, in my view, what the 21st century city starts to look like. It's this reconciliation of nature and the city. It's a more sustainable way of life where we are back on our feet, not relying so much on the automobile, where we have more things closer to hand. The lower right is an old industrial building transformed into a library next to a ferry terminal. The streets are lined with local shopping. You don't have to get in your car and go to a mall or a power center. Uh, and if you were a child growing up in this, city, in this neighborhood, in, in this part of Stockholm, and these are winter images deliberately, uh, what a joy to be able to do all of these things right in the heart of your neighborhood. The city literally becomes its own resort. So my conclusion in this talk, but also in my book, uh, which uh, draws also on, on many, many examples, is that this, this is a great moment for city building. Uh, I've been at this for over 30 years. There, there has never been a more exciting time. Uh, what we're, what's dawning on us and the public in many ways is ahead of the elected officials um, and municipal staff is that this is the time when in cities, and only in cities, where over 80% of Canadians live, and now 50% of the world's population, and soon growing to 75, only in cities can we make this shift to a new way of living, which acknowledges our place in nature, acknowledges our dependency on resources, both renewable and non-renewable, um, puts us back in a position where we are living in a more resourceful and sustainable way. Uh, we have no options but to make this change uh, at this point. If we don't, uh, we will be in peril, and it's becoming more and more clear. And the cities that recognize this and make this, transfer, this transformation most skillfully and engage their population in making the transformation, because this is not something that can be imposed top down will be the cities that achieve greatest success. Thank you very much.